This lecture is about open loop and closed loop payment systems. Now, this is a little technical, it's a little arcane, but it's something that you've really got to get a handle on if you're going to understand the way that our electronic payment systems work in the United States and around the world. Um, Electronic payment systems are basically things like the Visa card network, the MasterCard network, American Express. It also reaches into gift cards and other kinds of electronic platforms um, like Bitcoin, for instance, that are trying to replace cash with some kind of means of electronic value transfer. Let me talk first about open loop systems. I'll give you a formal definition and then get into how it works. Um, what open loop payment systems are, are basically electronic systems, networks, that connect financial institutions to each other, usually those are banks, so that customers and merchants can come together um, and a customer can make a payment to a merchant without cash, can make a payment electronically, and the merchant actually gets paid in the end. The, the payment system is the network that's connecting the customers and the merchants together. So, as I said, let me give you first a formal definition, an open loop payment system. It's a large network. It's connecting lots and lots of end parties. These are both consumers and merchants. And it connects them without them having to have a direct relationship with one another. Usually the links between the end users are financial intermediaries, banks and the banks themselves are all linked together through the open loop payment network. Now, I know this sounds kind of hard, but it's really not that hard at all. It's a pretty simple idea, really. This is what it looks like. And remember, the context here is to facilitate electronic payments, to, to do things without cash. Here we are. We have a bunch of merchants. Here's a little storefront. Here's another storefront. Here's another merchant. Here's another merchant. And we have a bunch of people. There's me and you and some other guy and some other gal. What I want to do here is I would like to pay this merchant without using cash. I don't have any cash in my wallet. What I'm going to do is use a credit card. Okay? I need a way that I can get my credit card to this merchant and this merchant knows that when they use my card that they're going to get paid at the end of the day. Well, my card is issued to me by a bank. Now, when you look at your credit card, you're probably not thinking about your bank at all, and your credit card probably didn't even come from the bank where you have a savings account. Um, you think of it as your Visa card or your MasterCard. But if you look at your card closely, you'll see a bank name there somewhere. It's been issued by a bank. The merchant similarly has a bank, um, and this bank is helping the merchant receive the payments that come to this merchant electronically from my credit card via my bank. It's the payment system in the middle. It's this network here that facilitates that transfer from me and my bank to the merchant and the merchant's bank. The payment system sits between the banks and mediates the transaction so that when I pay this merchant, at the end of the day, the merchant gets the funds. Here's how it works. Here's me and here's the merchant. I give my card to the merchant when I want to buy something. The merchant swipes the card through some kind of electronic device. This is an electronic point of sale device. That device sends a message to the merchant's bank. Now this is the merchant's bank. We call it the acquiring bank. It's acquired this merchant uh, as one of its clients. The device sends the message to the acquiring bank, hey, does Bill have enough money in his account? Is this a sufficient balance there? And is this authorized? Or maybe the card's been stolen or something. Is this a good card? The acquiring bank sends the message through the payment network. In this case, I've chosen MasterCard. Sends the message through the payment network, which conveys the message to the issuing bank, which is my bank. This is my bank here that's issued me the card, and asks the same question. Is there a sufficient balance? Is the payment authorized? My bank checks the balance, issues the authorization, and sends the message back through the network to the acquiring bank, back to the merchant's point of sale device. The merchant gets a confirmation that this is authorized, that there is a sufficient balance, and the merchant accepts the payment. That's basically how the system works. 
Now you may look at this and you may think, well gosh, this is an awfully complicated system. Why do we need all of these steps? Why do we need MasterCard here sitting in the middle between the acquiring bank and the issu issuing bank? You've got to remember this is in the context of cashless payments. This is in the context where I'm handing over a piece of plastic with a chip in it or an electronic stripe in it and the merchant really has no way of knowing if I'm good for the money and if this card is actually going to be authorized. So the merchant needs the acquiring bank to check through the network with the issuing bank all those questions about my balance in my account and then the issuing bank needs to send back the message, yes, in fact, they're good for the money, this is a valid card, and so on. Think about this a little bit more deeply. Why would I, as a consumer, not want to have a direct relationship between myself and the merchant? Why go through all the steps of going through these different banks and through the payment network? Well, one reason is that by having these intermediaries, I have a degree of protection if anything goes wrong, and I also have a degree of protection from the prying eyes of the merchant. I just want to go and buy stuff. I don't want the merchant pestering me next week about some other offer or some other deal necessarily. I also don't want the merchant to know everything about my business. In this kind of system, with the credit check and authorization going from bank to network to bank again and then back through the network, there's some extra steps of protection in there for me to protect me um, and uh, to protect my account. Why would the merchant be interested in this kind of system? Well, you know, I could, if I was a merchant, just issue credit on my own. I could just say, oh, here comes Bill. That's great. I know he's good for the money. He doesn't have any money today. I'm going to write down in my notebook, I gave Bill $2 worth of bubble gum, and he's going to pay me back sometime. I could do that if I want to. That's great. That becomes awful burdensome if I have a lot of customers and um, they're carrying a lot of credit with my store. It opens me to a lot of risk. What if none of them can pay back at the end of the day? So I want a system that will take care of that for me, that will keep a ledger for me of customers who have credit and who are using that credit on my store. And I don't want to have to issue that credit myself. I want someone else to take responsibility for issuing credit. And that's basically what the banks do. That's what your bank does when it issues you a credit card. It's issuing you a line of credit. Um, this also, as, as a merchant, this also gives me protection if, um, say, you've stolen the card. Well, the card network will tell me, this is a stolen card, don't accept it. Or if you have insufficient funds or insufficient credit, the card network will tell me that. So it protects me from those issues as well. But notice that from the point of view of both the merchant and the customer for the end users, we have something that starts to approximate cash. We can come together, I can make a payment to you if you're the merchant, and then we both get to go our separate ways. It replicates this sort of freedom of cash. I can pay and go, and also from the merchant point of view, the merchant can accept the card payment if it's authorized by the system, and then the merchant doesn't have to worry about it ever again doesn't have to worry about tracking me down if there's a problem, the network deals with that. If also on the, at the, same, on the other side of the, the fence here, from the customer's point of view, let's say the merchant um, accidentally charges me twice. Well, um, the card network will help me and the bank get it back, right? So we have in the system, without using cash, some of the freedom of cash to just pay and go with some additional added protections in case anything goes wrong. There are a few disadvantages and advantages to open loop systems though. The first thing is I need to get a whole lot of different entities to participate and to agree to a set of rules for how this is going to go. I need to get all of the banks together who are issuing credit and who are acquiring merchants all to agree to participate in my open loop network and agree to a set of rules about how that network is going to work. One nice thing is that once I've done that, I've got a terrific way to allocate liability and risk. Because there are so many intermediaries, we can see at every step of the way, if something goes wrong, who's responsible. We can allocate liability. We can also spread the risk. And we can scale really rapidly because a bank isn't just going to have one client with a credit card. It's going to have a ton of clients with a credit card. And a bank isn't just going to acquire one merchant. It's going to acquire a whole set of merchants. So banks, 
through their role as intermediary, can work together to basically scoop up all the consumers who want to participate in the electronic payment network and all the merchants who want to accept that network much faster than if the merchants were trying to do it on their own. You end up creating an awful lot of convenience for consumers and for merchants. There's some risks here though. For one thing, in an open loop system that's using banks as the intermediary, you're basically providing a link to a bank account and you're going to have the same risks that you have with any bank account. One of the primary risks that people worry about in the regulatory community is what we call AML-CFT risk. That stands for anti-money laundering and countering the financing of terrorism. We want to make sure that people opening up bank accounts are not bad apples, are not people who are trying to launder money, are not people who are trying to disguise where their funds are coming from and where their funds are going to fund bad activities. So the protection that we have is something called KYC, Know Your Customer. Banks are required to obtain basic identifying information on all of their customers, including credit card and debit card customers, so that they know that you're not one of these bad apples. There's also credit risk. So if it's a credit card, there's the risk that I don't pay back. That's going to hit the bank's balance sheet. There's also the risk um, that of insufficient funds. If I don't have enough money in my account or not enough credit in my account, then the thing's not going to go through. That, that's a risk that's caught usually at the point of sale when the merchant receives a message back through the network saying that this payment is not authorized. There's also fraud risk. Someone could steal my card or my card information and start using it without my knowledge. And fraud risk increases in what's called card not present transactions. Um, card not present transactions are the kind of transactions that take place over the internet or if you're calling up a, a pizza delivery service and reading to them your card number over the phone. And I won't go into it, but there's an entire sub-industry in the payments industry devoted to card not present transactions. Now, let me talk about another kind of payment system. Closed loop systems. Closed loop are different than open loop in that there aren't a whole lot of intermediaries involved. This is a payment system where there's a direct relationship between the consumers and the merchants through the payment network. And it's that network itself and not the banks that are going around getting customers and merchants that are enrolling both the consumer and the merchant. What's interesting in this system is that that closed loop payment system controls the whole thing. It can set all the terms, it sets all the rules, it has total control over the entire system. Now, again, remember that we're dealing in a context where people are trying to facilitate transactions without the use of cash, to go cashless, right? So in a closed loop system, basically you've got me here and you've got the vendor here. The payment system, our closed loop system, goes out and says to the merchant, hey, be part of my system and I'll let you start accepting electronic transactions. The merchant says, great, I'll do it. The payment system also comes to me and says, hey, would you like to buy things at this merchant without the use of cash? Well then, use my payment system and I'll let you do it. So it's enrolling the consumer and the merchant directly. There's no bank here that's involved that's intermediating between us. Now, the problem is we live in a world with lots and lots of people and lots and lots of merchants. So if you're a closed loop payment system, you have your work cut out for you. You yourself have to go about individually signing up all the merchants and individually signing up all the customers. This seems like a lot of work, so why would anybody bother to do it? Well, there are some terrific advantages to this system. It doesn't have the same scale that you can get in an open loop system, because in an open loop system, any bank's customer can ultimately be part of it. Here, you're having to enroll all these people and, and, and merchants yourself. But the advantage is you get total control total control of everything, of the relationship with the consumer and the merchant, and all the data that's going back and forth between them. One of the biggest and most familiar closed loop payment systems is American Express. Now you might think of this as open loop because you can use your American Express card if you have one pretty much anywhere. But you know, in fact, if you try to do that, you'll find there are some merchants that just don't accept it because the merchant hasn't yet been enrolled into the system. 
But this, this slide and the next one are from a corporate presentation. You can go visit it online here at the link by Amex explaining what they see to be the benefits of their system. They proudly tout that they're a closed loop network. And you'll see here on the left, one of their chief principles is that by being closed loop, they have all the card member data, they have all the merchant data, they have all the transaction data, and any externally acquired data that's involved in that transaction. They know everything that's going on for their consumers. They know everything that's going on for their merchants, as opposed to, say, the open loop MasterCard or Visa networks where there are all these intermediaries um, by independent merchant acquirers, which is the independent banks, and independent bank networks issuing the cards, which is the, the folks who issue the cards. They all can fight with each other over use of the data involved in transactions, but basically all the little banks involved here are holding it all independently. With Amex, Amex has everything. Um, another thing is that since they've got control of the entire system, they have reduced risk of fraud and, um, and importantly here, their bullet point number two, they get unique insights into people's spending trends, buying patterns, and benchmarking. Okay. Now, if you're interested in the Amex model, Here's an uh, article by Forbes that you can look at that contrasts Amex with Visa and closed loop versus open loop in terms of um, the business proposition and the business model here. Now, at a smaller scale than American Express, most transit cards and retail specific gift cards are closed loop cards. You can only use them at specific stores or at specific, for specific items or specific modes of transit. This is an octopus card for the Hong Kong Transit. This is the um, LA Metro's Transit Pass. Um, here's an iTunes card and here's a Target gift card. Right? So you can only use the iTunes card at the iTunes store. You can only use the Target card at Target. There's a closed loop, so to speak, between uh, you and the merchant through this closed payment network that only lets you spend the electronic value that you have on these cards in a particular place. So let's talk about some of the advantages and disadvantages of closed loop payment systems. For one thing, given this business about all the data that they're able to, to handle and, and control, they're terrific for things like customer loyalty programs. If I'm American Express and I've got a consumer who's using American Express exclusively, I know all the data on how they're spending their money and when. If I'm Visa, um, I know it, but the bank knows it too, and the merchant's bank knows some of it, and so on. If I'm Amex, I've got it all. If I'm Target, I can use this idea of loyalty to build things like membership programs. Right? You're a member of the Target family, since you're using our card, and Target is going to reward you with coupons or offers or whatever. The next important thing is you can set all the rules. With an open loop system, you have to get all the different banks to agree to a set of rules. You also control all the data, as I've said. But a key disadvantage is it's much harder to scale. It's much harder to make a closed loop system really, really big than an open loop system. There are also some risks to closed loop. Generally, since closed loop systems, especially things like gift cards or transit cards, are, are operating with lower values or operating with a prepaid system, um, there's less AML CFT risk. There's less chance of money laundering because we're dealing with lower value um, items, not with Amex, but, but certainly with a gift card or a transit card. But for the consumer, there's insolvency risk. What if I have a gift card at a business that then goes bankrupt? Well, I've got a gift card that's worthless. Right? Similarly, what if I lose my gift card or what if it's stolen? If I, if I lose my transit card, well, I'm out of luck. There's nothing really I can do. Also, what if I have you know, four or five cents left on a gift card? And I'm probably never going to use it. So there's this kind of risk of, of uh, redeeming unused value. I might have some value in there that's just not worth it for me to redeem. That makes it a less useful payment system to me um, than another kind of payment system. Often with closed loop products too, because they're not being run by banks, they're subject to different regulatory requirements and often have a lower threshold of regulatory scrutiny. They don't have to give as many disclosures to regulators. There's often hidden fees. These things can, can sometimes be uh, quite bad for the consumer. And 
Uh, there are some interesting reports by the Consumers Union on the risks to consumers posed by closed-loop uh, products. Now, gift cards, which I've mentioned, can be either open or closed-loop. So you could have an open-loop gift card branded by a network like Visa or MasterCard that you can use at any merchant. So it looks like a gift card, but if you look at it closely, you'll see that it's backed by a bank, and the bank is the intermediary between the gift card and the Visa network, which then allows it to be used at all the merchants that uh, accept Visa or MasterCard. You have quasi-open-loop gift cards if they're branded by one of the big closed-loop networks, like American Express or Discover. Um, it sort of operates like an open loop, except that the scale isn't quite as big as you're going to get with Visa or MasterCard, MasterCard. And then you have a lot of gift cards that are closed loop and vendor specific. So you could have a, a uh, closed loop gift card from one merchant, a cl another closed loop gift card from another merchant, a closed loop gift card for an online retailer, and so on. They're often vendor specific. I just wanted to go off on a quick brief tangent for a minute to give you something on the history of gift cards, because it's an interesting history here. Gift cards originated with gift certificates. And here's an example of a gift certificate um, from a number of years ago from the Baskin and Robbins ice cream shop. This is a paper certificate. It's from Paul to Linda Lane for $2. You'll see it has a, uh, a number stamped on it to authorize it. It says it's only good at this particular store in Champaign, Illinois. Well, these are very popular items. These are very popular ways to drive business. It's a nice way to give a gift. But in the 1990s, a lot of retailers started to have problems with gift cards. And the problems came about because of the increasing spread of color photocopiers and color printers. People could take these things and just run them off on a color copier at work or print them off on a color printer at home and uh, you know, essentially defraud the businesses by using uh, counterfeit gift certificates. Well, at the same time in the 90s that this was taking place, a company named Blackhawk, which was part of the Safeway uh, supermarket chain, started working on these, these kinds of hooks to display product. These are called J-hooks, because they look like the letter J. And J-hooks are great to display a lot of merchandise in a small place. You can put a whole lot of, of merchandise in a small area with these J-hooks. And I just have an example here of, of what you can do with a rack with lots of J-hooks. You can get a whole lot more candy and gum or whatever in, on a very small footprint um, if you're using these hooks. Well, Blackhawk was looking for, and its clients were looking for, a high value product that they could display in their stores with a small footprint. Okay, We want something really expensive that we can display in a very small amount of space. And Blackhook, to make a long story, story short, Blackhook went from being a maker of J-hooks to becoming the largest uh, gift card network that we have. So here we have a gift card display in a supermarket. It's a very small footprint, but th these are incredibly high value products. You can see that we've got a $50 Starbucks gift card, a you know, $25 Subway gift card, and so on. Lots and lots and lots of expensive items in a very small place. And that's how basically Blackhawk went from being a maker of hook displays to being one of the biggest uh, networks for gift cards. Let me just wrap this up with some concluding thoughts. It's always important to remember when you're thinking about closed loop and open loop systems, this is all in the bigger context of trying to facilitate electronic cashless payments. There's no point in doing open or closed loop uh, except to get people to stop using cash and to facilitate electronic payments. Now, doing things electronically, however, without a physical token, without a piece of paper or some coins, raises a whole bunch of issues, especially because it's introducing a lot of other players into the transaction. If I hand you a dollar bill, you know it's a dollar bill, you accept it, end of story. If I hand you a gift card or a credit card, there's a whole lot of other players that are instantly involved in that transaction, and those are the players that are helping facilitate that electronic payment. So whenever you see a payment system, whenever you see a system that's not using uh, physical tokens of, of cash or coin to make a payment happen, first ask yourself, is it open or closed loop? 
Is it the kind of thing that has a huge scale that can be used at merchants all over the place? Um, is it facilitated by intermediaries and banks that have a gigantic footprint? Or is it a closed loop system? Can it only be used at one merchant or a family of merchants? Can it only be used at uh, a smaller scale um, than, than, a, than an open loop system? Also ask yourself, why does it matter whether this is open or closed? Is there a role for intermediaries? Is there a kind of buffer between the merchant and the customer the way there, that there is with um, an open loop system? Who authorizes the transaction? Who's setting the rules? What protections are there if something goes wrong? What protections are there for the consumer? What protections are there for the merchant? What are the risks? What kind of risks are they? How big are they? What happens when things go wrong with the transaction? Is there a way to get the money back? Is there a way to fix a fraudulent transaction? In most of the open loop systems that we have today, there is. In most of the closed loop systems, there is too. But with closed loop, as we saw, there are other risks. Like if you have a closed loop card from a business uh, and then that business um, goes bankrupt, you're out of luck. Finally, can the system scale? Can it get bigger? And why does it matter if it can get bigger, if it can scale? That's where I'll wrap up. If you want to learn more, you should go out and play with some gift cards. Thanks.